unfortunately, a lot of times we walk in and go, it's at, we have in the past walked in and gone, it's our way or the highway. Right. You must adhere to our rules and regulations or else you will be breached. The end of the world, everything's going to burn down. It isn't that way. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Cybersecurity Stand Up. I'm your host, Brown and Hudson. Oh my gosh, there's almost so many special guests happening already. <laughs> this is the best. <laughs> Um, today, team, I'm joined by Chris Roberts. He's an incredible CISO. Um, you'll hear about him in just a second. Um, but in case you're hearing just the audio of this, there's some amazing puffy action happening on screen in front of me. <laughs> so come watch the video because you're, you're missing out already if you're just audio. Um, Chris, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe who you're, uh, who you're, you're scruffing right now? Yeah, so that's Daisy. Um, <laughs> She is the matriarch of the household. Absolutely the matriarch of the Hi. You okay? She's, she's the matriarch of the household by far and away. Um, she is uh, one of the rescues. The two rescue Great Danes, Milo is my buddy rescue, Daisy is as well. Um, started off looking after uh, a friend's Great Dane and that was like, holy smoke, this is amazing. Aww. And then went to look at obviously... Big dog, big big dogs, great paws or great paws, big dogs, whatever they are, and then uh, found Daisy, then Milo, and then uh, when when Jen and I were still together, um, she got uh, Otis. So if she's out traveling, I'll come and stay up here and look after them. And if I'm traveling, Milo stays here, all that kind of good stuff. So it works out pretty well. But yeah, so that's these guys. Um, yeah, I guess I've been creeping around our industry for more years than I care to probably admit to. That's why you have the green beard and no flipping hair, let's face it. You That's know, I great. first started... Oh, yeah, my gosh. I mean, let's face it. I first started messing around with computer systems when all we had was mainframes and we didn't even really have DOS. And then DOS turned up and it was great. And then somebody came out with this interface and then off we went from there. So, yeah, I took a break. I hit the military and uh, jumped oh, yeah. out of airplanes, got kicked out of submarines for a while. And then, um, yeah, back into this industry and been in the U.S. since 98 and all over the place. Wild. So this is my my knock-up question that is specific to you because I know that you weren't born in the U.S. So you have this crucial yes. piece of information that I want your insight on. How do you make the perfect cup of tea? Oh, I was saying this is interesting. There, This is like a religious conversation Yes. Because, um, so there are people that put the milk in after the water and uh -huh. there are people that put the milk in before the water. And, and it, it, there are wars over this one. There's like a religious divide war over this yeah. whole thing. Um, I, I actually, I swing both ways. Um, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I don't care. I, I put the bloody milk in if you want. Um, but put the bloody milk in. So I have, uh, I use Yorkshire gold as my tea. Now there are times I will brew tea in a pot. There are times where I will take the tea bag, throw it in the cup, add hot water to the bloody thing and then chuck some milk in or chuck the milk in then the hot water. I will typically put the hot water in first because then I get to see the color of the tea, get it to the, get it to where I want it, how strong I want it. And then I'll chuck one milk in afterwards. So yeah. Yeah. That is, that, that, that is wars have been started over less things than should one put one's milk in before or after one has watered the tea. Well, I think that that's a perfectly good reason to have a war. Um, and because I feel very strongly about it myself, and I, I completely agree with you. The color of the tea seems to be step one. But my next question yeah. is, do you take the tea bag out before you put the milk in? Ooh. Just, I literally, I, ironically, I've got a cup of tea over there. Uh, did I well, take the tea bag out? You know, this is, yeah, I was going to say, hang on, I'm going to go get my bloody cup of tea as well, actually, right. while we're thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. I don't know... My gosh, I think most of the time I probably do take the tea bag out before before the milk goes in. It's it's not fun squeezing a milky tea bag. Let's face it. Exactly. But but and the other thing is as well, it makes more of a bloody pie. It makes more of a bloody mess as well. So yeah, I think the tea bag comes out, then the milk goes in. Yeah, because then you can see how strong the tea was, <laughs> and you can yep. see the color that you've adjusted it to. 
Now, the only downside on that one, and this is why I know I leave it in sometimes, is if you pour the milk and you're like, oh, good grief of life, that looks just like a pale shade of white. Therefore, yes. you squeeze the living heck out of the tea bag several times. Preach. Well, <laughs> I don't think we'll have to go to war today because we're in enough agreement <laughs> that we're safe. Okay. <laughs> so I remember, oh my gosh, I mean, this, so this is going back some time. I, I remember going over to... My grandmother wasn't so much about the ceremony side, but my great grandmother, mm-hmm. if that t- it, it was always in a teapot, it was always loose tea. And mm-hmm. heavens forbid that you forget to put the tea cozy on the teapot to keep the tea warm. That was, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, that was, you got the backside of a ladle at that point in time. <laughs> my, my. <laughs> Speaking of wars, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my great grandmother was very particular about ensuring the the tea remained warm, and it was one of those classic, yes. like the brownstone teapots and whatever the hell they're made of. But I mean, they're like classic teapot, and it had. I remember one of the tea cozies was hand knit, but there was another one that was like a quilted tea cozy. Oh yeah, those that was oh yeah. Oh, and you um you always when you were pouring the cup of tea, you poured it out into the strainer, and the tea bags always went into the garden. Huh. Wow, it's such a, such a ritual, you know. Like, Get out of my tea. No, stay forever. Hi. <laughs> She'll occasionally have some of my tea. Milo, if he knows I'm making a cup of tea, when I get towards the end of it, he will have some partly because it's a little milky and it's a little sweet. I put, yeah, yeah. I don't put as much sugar in it anymore. I put like about a half the sugar in it, but there's still some sweetness there. Uh huh. Interesting. It's good to know. This is like good personal information, you know. The, only, only the crucial pieces. Totally. Love it. So Chris, I've met you in person, I think a couple times now. And one of the first things that people notice about you if they're meeting you in person is your phenomenal beard, whatever color it might be <laughs> in that moment, whatever change might be occurring. Can you yep. tell us about that? What's the origin? Is it just fun? What's the deal? So I think it, it started out as almost a re- almost a rebellion. Uh, I was working for an organization which wanted me to be relatively clean shaven and well, I'm me and that doesn't work. So I'd always had like the sides and I'd probably had it like at about this level. And I'm like, I'm going to grow the darn thing. And I think it was a rebellion against not just the organization, but just the whole institution of leadership. Yes. Um, and I think, you know, it was... It, so there's definitely that part of it. I, I'm so, I mean, this in various forms has been around 15 plus years, 15, 15 okay. plus years. Um, and, and honestly, what it's turned into is a couple of different things. It's, I, I'm not small, so I'm fairly large and imposing. I'm a lot smaller than I used to be, but I'm still large and imposing. So again, I, I'm six foot three. I normally look like I'm going to kill somebody because that's normally just the state of affairs that my brain's in. And so, you know, you walk up to somebody and there's this instant, is it going to eat me or is it just going to bury me in the desert? So this helps disarm people, you know, between this, the vibrams, and, you know, if I'm wearing the kilt or the overalls or something, it takes that barrier down, which means I don't have to get over the initial, hi, I promise I'm not going to eat your brains, you know? Yeah. Um, I also, it's also for me a challenge. It's one of those things where, uh, I, you know, it, my peers, there are some of my peers who are absolutely amazing, who have a similar approach. Then there are some people in business, either within the security or just leadership in general, who, you know, if you're not wearing a watch, they won't talk with you. They won't interview. I've seen that comment on LinkedIn. If you're, you know, if you haven't got a suit and tie on, you're, you're not considered business professional. And the same thing with this, you know, I, I really like challenging people's norms. I don't have a different shade of color of my skin. I, I'm fairly, I'm fairly agnostic when it comes to a number of other things. Um, so really the differentiator is I want people to stick there. I want people to think a little bit more. The other one is also, I think the other, the other one is walking into a company or walking into a business. Um, I have so many times walked into places and you get that look like, what are you doing here? Did you get dragged in by the, you know, by the dog on the, on the bottom of the dog's paw kind of mentality? Right, right. Oof. Um, oh, I, it's, it's happened. But then you get the flip of it. I always remember back in the UK, uh, I remember walking into a car dealership and I turned up in a fairly nice car. 
not nothing too crazy, too special, but a fairly nice car. And what it is is I just finished I finished painting some stuff. So I had on like an old pair of trousers, paint splatters on them, probably a fairly ripped t shirt. Um, and I walked into this car dealership and literally all the sales guys ignored the hell out of me. The senior like tech guy who was behind this who was behind one of the counters recognized the car, saw me, and we started talking. And he's like, you know, what are you what brings you in? And I'm like, I'm hunting for another car. And he's like, well, let's go take a look. So he and I went and geeked out and everything else. At which point the salespeople started to smell blood in the water, wanted to come over. And I just looked at them and said, you all can fuck off. Yeah. I'm like, I have no intentions of dealing with you. You you went for your first sight and you ignored me. I'm going to deal with him. He's getting the commissions. And I walked out of there. Um, I traded in one of my cars and I walked out with a very, very nice Lotus Esprit. Um, Yes, please. All right. Yeah. And so it's it's that it's I want to I spend a lot of time fighting for diversity, for equity, for inclusion, and for, and not just we're not just talking from the human aspect. I'm talking from the thought aspect. Mm. And so, what better way to actually challenge it than sometimes by walking up with you know purple beard, pink beard, orange beard, green beard, and odd color. I mean, the, I've got the blue specs on, not the red ones on today. Okay. And I'm, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's that, it's, it's making people think. Yeah. Love it. So one thing that I, I really love about your presence on LinkedIn is what you're, I mean, it's like the digital version of what you're talking about, like showing up, yeah. being different, presenting yourself as who you are and letting people kind of like judge you as they will. And yeah. then you're gonna be able to respond in the way that you feel right. But one thing I wanted to ask you is how'd you get there? Because it takes a lot of guts, it takes a lot of confidence and, yeah. and you're, you're doing it consistently. You're showing up with this very crisp content. You're not afraid, but like any, any tips on, on building that self-confidence, if that's what it is. It is. And in some ways I am afraid, you know, I, I am afraid of, I'm afraid of letting people down. I think more than anything Mm -hmm. else these days, I realize, especially on LinkedIn and and even in the community, I'm ridiculously fortunate that, that I have a lot of people that I call friends, I call family and that just know me. Yeah. Um, that comes with a lot of responsibility. And, and, and so I never, ever want to let people down. Now, getting to that point, I had to grow thick skin uh, in no two ways about it. And, and I, I'm, I'm good and bad at it. And probably some of the biggest realizations were back in like 2015, 2016, when, the, when all the airplane shit show went down. Um, I knew what I'd been doing and we'd been doing it and researching it for like five or six years. And we tried telling people, we tried telling them, we were watching people die and we're like, this isn't good. Therefore, we have to change things. So you go out on a limb and you put yourself out there. And, and in one hand, there are a lot of people like, hey, that's great. And there are a lot of people in the industry and around the industry who were armchair critics and just absolutely slammed me. Mm. Um, that hurt. I mean, it took a lot out of me. It took a lot personally out of me. It took a lot professionally out of me. And I'm still fighting some of those fights today. So I'd already had thick-ish skin, mm. but it had to grow a lot thicker. And I think at that point, it became more and more apparent that the person I need to be is the person I am. It's me. I'm I want people to see me on LinkedIn. I want people to see me on videos and I want people to catch me. I don't care if they catch me at a conference. I don't care if they catch me at a coffee shop. I don't care if they catch me walking around freaking, you know, Whole Foods or somewhere. I, I, I want that, that person to be the same bloody person. Totally. Um, and that's, I think that's a bit, I mean, that's a big part of it is, is can I look, can I look at everybody else and go, look, I gave you the true me. You have the opportunity to take it or leave it. And, and yeah. I realized that that 15, 16 incident, because I'd been in the press a bunch before then. I'd been in the press a whole bunch in like 2010, 2011. I'd been in the press early US times and other times as well. And very early on, somebody said to me, you can't please all people all the time. You really, really can't. It, it, it is life and, and you are going to have to accept it. It's just going to take a while to figure that one out. Um, I am also judicious using the block button. I have no problems if, yeah. if somebody's being an ass or if somebody's just just tweaking and poking. I have zero issues with that block button, report and block or just simply block. I don't care. End of story. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Keeping a solid boundary up and feeling like, why not use that? Use it liberally. Well, and, uh, 
you know, to me, I want anybody to be able to come up to me and call bullshit and be able to do it respectfully and safely. Mm. And so if you can be respectful and call bullshit, I have zero problem with it. If you can't be respectful, I have no time for you. I, I really have no time for you. And so I, I curate to some degree a lot of the, I always respond on my LinkedIn posts because I want people to have that safe space. I want people as, and I put a post out today, I put the Douglas Adams post out today. I want people to comment. I want people to challenge. And we, there was a good crazy conversation about freaking particle physics on there as well, which is Amazing. awesome. Yeah. But I also want people to be respectful, to know that I'm happy to have other opinions. I have zero problem with that. Again, as long as it's approached respectfully. Mm-hmm. So if I see that, if I see something going on that's not respectful, I typically will step in either on the comments or behind the scenes in direct messages and say, hey, knock it off, figure it out. This is not the Wild West. And so, you know, I think I hope most people feel that they can just put whatever they, they want out in front of me and, and it is what it is. Same thing in person. Yeah. You know, I've, I've had some freaking amazing conversations at conferences. You know, I'm heading up to Canada uh, next week and I'm looking forward to just sitting down with the teams, with the students, with the volunteers, and just freaking hanging out and having some good talks. Definitely. Yeah. Do you think that's something that's changed within the cyber industry, very broadly speaking, over the past, I mean, couple of decades? Because I feel like, the, actually, it's funny you mentioned the term Wild West, because I've heard this industry described as that previously, that like 15, you know, yeah. 10 years ago was kind of the Wild West. Oh, yeah, what do you think totally. has changed? Like, have things gotten better? <laughs> I th- I want to say yes for the m- there's good and bad about getting better. I think on the good side, a lot of us who were probably participating in building the Wild West, I'll, I mean, mm-hmm. good grief. I remembered war driving Columbus, Ohio, literally with a Volvo with an antenna in the back, building war driving maps of Africa and Eclipse. I mean, I remember getting arrested at DEF CON. I remember doing stupid shit there. Oh, yeah, it, it, so this is numerous times. So we perpetuated that wild, wild west. And then we grew up, we had families. We started to realize we had responsibilities. We weren't just geeks having fun and building stuff and breaking stuff and trying to get people to listen. We had to start talking and educating the way everybody else understands. We had to grow up and be part of the business, not adverse to the business. Same thing with IT, same thing with tech. And now so many of us are in those C-level positions where I have to walk in and go talk to a board of directors. I have to talk to senior leadership and I can't walk in as the wild, wild west. I can have a little bit of fun, the beard and everything else, but I still have to be able to walk in and go, hey, look, um, we all understand the risk is present. Let's have a conversation about the probabilities of risk. Let's understand about what we can do to quantify it. Let's understand how we measure it. Let's how, understand how it affects the business at a fiscal level, at a, you know, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And then go back and geek out with the team on how we remediate some of the stuff. Gotcha. So how did you personally gain those skills? Because that's a lot, you just listed off a lot of, a lot of skills. <laughs> <laughs> Trial and error in some cases. I mean, absolutely trial and error in some cases no offense about about it i've also been for, I've, I've been fortunate as well um i have been in colorado since 0506 and i was actually brought out here by a very dear friend who became a very good mentor and so i listened to him uh rob rob and rob and i go back a long long time and he helped me understand how to communicate more effectively with leadership. He helped me understand how to present more effectively when talking about technology in a business way. And so I looked at him, I watched him, and I learned from him. I had another amazing mentor, a CFO mentor, donkey's years ago, who was the same way. If I couldn't explain it to him, an old Italian guy, I'd walk in, and Tunio was great. I would walk in, and I'd I'd try explaining. He'd be like, I'm like, okay. We'll try it again. And if I couldn't explain it to him in a way that he was able to understand, grasp, acknowledge, and realize in three tries, it wasn't going to happen. Wow. Yeah. So it was, and it wasn't done out of nastiness, grumpiness. It was done out of necessity because a, he needed to understand because he needed to talk to the board at that point, and I needed to work with him more effectively. So it worked out really, really well. 
Yeah, definitely. You know, you're, you're not the first person to say that. And I think it's actually really, it's good, very widely applicable advice that to be, if you're able to explain something to an eight year old, I don't know, that's the actual indicator that you understand it like fully. But my question too is, when you're go when you walk into a board meeting where let's say you're at a new company, I don't know, so you don't have pre existing relationships, you maybe yeah. know what the roles are. What what do you feel like is missing? Because a lot of the discourse that's around like security and business kind of generally, there's a big gap there, right? So what what's missing? Yeah. What's getting lost? I think a couple of things. One's probably empathy, an empathetic view of the business. Yeah, very much so. Because unfortunately, a lot of times we walk in and go, "It's our, we have in the past walked in and gone, it's our way or the highway. Right. You must adhere to our rules and regulations or else you will be breached, the end of the world, everything's going to burn down. It isn't that way. So part of it's empathy and having an empathetic, an empathetic position with the business. Mm. Security is part of what makes an organization work or not work, as the case may be. So how do we help? How do we enable all those good things? Part of it is also being able to read other people. Mm. Not everybody's good at that. Um, some of us are chameleons. I, I know very well I can be a chameleon when I walk into a room. I can walk into a room and very quickly go, okay, you need answers. You need stories. You don't care. You need direction. You're looking at somebody else. And it would very quickly be able to work out, okay, who do I talk to? Who, who am I? Yeah. Who's my audience? Who in the room is the person that everybody's looking to? Uh-huh. And who do I have to tell a story to? Who do I have to give statistics to? Who do I have to give third-party examples to? Who do I need to go out for a cup of coffee with? And, and who's just going to follow the lead? And, and being able to read that room ridiculously quickly is a huge skill that, you know, social engineering teaches you. Just honestly, life skills teaches you as well. Totally. Do you think there's also, I'm not digging for a specific answer here. I'm more just no, curious, totally, yeah. like, is there also something that's missing about, I guess, maybe how how businesses should be investing in cyber? Because a lot of the conversations too are, are about like budgets getting cut or, you know, yeah. security isn't being considered essential or, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I w- I'm running through that in one of the organizations I'm I'm part of at the moment. I'm running through some of that because the organization is is hunting for money. Right. And we're talking serious money. I mean, they're doing okay, but they're hunting for serious money for the next phase. And so security has, has definitely been deprioritized is probably too harsh of a word. Mm-hmm. But it definitely has been said, okay, can you can you tread water for a while? And yeah. There are two answers. You can take the asshole approach and go, oh, absolutely not. Yeah, we, we are. Or you can turn and say, hey, I've got to help the business. Yes, here's what we will do. Here is how we will work with you. Here is this. But understand, happy to tread water, but just realize we can't fix all the risks, all, all the issues. We can't do this. This is all on hold. As long as the business is willing to assume that and understand that and know it in a way that they do, then I'm okay doing that. I'm not because the big part of me wants to always protect, but I realize I can't always be, you, know, you can't always be number one. You're like, hey, yeah, you got to raise the money. You got to do this. You got to do this. Get that shit sorted. I got you covered. And we'll, we'll work, we will work through it. Yeah. So at the moment, what is a day in your life like? <laughs> I mean, you're, you're chaotic. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, chaotic. I know that you've been traveling a bunch. I know that you're a CISO. I feel like every single other, you know, LinkedIn post that I see is either you going somewhere and cycling, taking on 17 new roles, putting on 20 <laughs> different hats. Like what? Not that there's yeah. an average day, but if there was. <laughs> so I, so let, let's see, let's start with the biking. Uh, I haven't been out on the bike in a couple of weeks since driving me nuts. Scott, because the weather in this neck of the woods is terrible. Um, and I've given myself a hall pass as much as I don't like doing it. I'm like, okay, I can't be all the things all the time. So true. I have given myself a bit of a hall pass on that one. Um, saying that, hopefully next couple of days, I'm going to head down and pick up. I actually bought myself a road bike. So oh. I'm going to head down and pick up the road bike. Yeah. Well, because I got the mountain bikes and I can go bounce around on the mountains. But the problem is, is my, uh, the, pl- the Trek store where I have the rail, um, they were noticing, shall we say, that the because it's it's a it's a hybrid bike, so it's got the speedo thing on it. Well, they were noticing when they were doing a lot of the work on it. They're like, "You're hitting 45, 48, 45, 46, 48 miles an hour on your mountain bike. 
are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, well, because I'm I'm up in so up in Netherlands, I'll go bounce around the hills on the gravel. I'm only doing about thirty five on the gravel, but I'll take it up to like Eldora, or I'll take it up to some of the other ones, and I'll come down the hill. And I'm chasing cars. I'm actually trying to go buy cars at the same time, just for, just for sheer shit and giggles, <laughs> just just for the hell of it. And, and they had to explain to me that you know a large man on a fifty pound bike um, at forty five to fifty mile an hour is going to hurt. Yes. Therefore, might I consider getting a road bike that is a less than half the weight, b more rigid. And C is built to do 40, 50, 60 miles an hour downhill. I'm like, okay. And I'm like, but, but, but. they're like, no. I'm like, but, but, but. I'm like oh. So I relented. Uh, I bought a road bike and uh, it should be ready for me hopefully soon, like this weekend when I'm heading to Canada. So yeah, um, yeah, the Manzi bike's great. I mean, that to me is it's uh, it's get out there, it's get away from everything. I do take tech with me because I need you know SOS if I need to if I if I do stupid shit like this again um, and all the other silly things I've done. Yeah. Um, but I so my typical day is I'll start at whatever hour of the morning I wake up, and sometimes it's seven eight o'clock in the morning, sometimes it's nine. Well, I will not take meetings until ten o'clock in the morning. Um, I'll occasionally do podcasts earlier and various other things, but I won't do a meeting until 10 in the morning because I want to get up. I want to check email from the night before. I want to get a cup of tea. I want to get prepared. So I hit the ground running. Exactly. From 10 o'clock until 12, 12, 30, 1 o'clock, it's, it's heads down. For the most part, it's very, very tactical. Okay. So either I'm responding to stuff at Boom, I'm working on New Spire, I'm doing the stuff for the next year, I'm doing stuff with some of the other crews that I'm working with. I'm doing, but it's all very, very tactical. Mm. I put a break in there because I'm either feeding these guys if I'm here or feeding him if I'm around or I'm getting myself some food. I deliberately put a, a break in there, 30 minutes, so that I don't forget to eat. Yep. Been then there. back in the afternoon, heads down again. And it's either, again, it's very, it's typically it's fairly tactical and it's either like podcasts or meetings or stuff like that. Yep. My Friday afternoons I set aside for vendor type of meetings. So that's the only time of day, that's the only time of the week I will actually set aside for vendors. Now, our Israeli friends, sometimes I'll do them on Thursday afternoon, sometimes they're all Thursday morning, sometimes they're on Fridays. Depends on you know where they are and where they're working. Same thing with the folks over in Saudi and everywhere else. Mm-hmm. I finish, I down tools at six o'clock. So I will step away from the computer at six o'clock. Now, as the sun comes back up again, that means I can go biking. That means I get to feed. That means I get to cook if I'm hanging out with Aklam or her crew or if I'm here. It means I get to do other things. Yeah. I pick back up again, 9.30, 10 o'clock at night. I start back up again. 10 o'clock at night till anywhere from midnight till 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. That's my strategic time. Yeah, that's the time I get to research. I get to put my decks together. I get to clean up on stuff I haven't done. I get to sit down and I get to think. I get to read. I get to research. I get to... You know, I at the end of every single year, I throw all my presentations away. So I'm now rebuilding for 2024 and some wow. 25. So that's my time to do all that. Like I'm heading up to Canada and I'm doing a talk on basically invading Canada. So how would we invade Canada? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing the CISO XC conference down in, uh, with uh, Cecil Pineda and that crew. And I'm, I'm actually going to give an entire talk on how to annex Texas. Texas always says it wants to be annexed from the union and make its own country. I'm like, fuck it. Well, let me demonstrate by how critical infrastructure, by roads, transportation, third-party vendors, supply chain, I'll annex you. Uh, just say the word. I'll hit the button. <laughs> it's like slightly threatening. I love it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Just, just shit, shit and giggle. Um, so that's my time. I do that. Like, uh, I last year over in Saudi, um, I got asked to come up with something fun and life hacking. So I knew that his excellency would be sitting in the audience. So I took over, I, I basically sent his camels to China and I replaced his camels with a whole bunch of camels from China. And, um, apparently found out very, very quickly that he has some very prized camels and some of them are win beauty pageant contests, like $8 million camels. So needless to say, um, it went down very, very well, but I had some also some very interesting conversations as well. It was fun. I think that you, I don't think I'd realize this about you, but I think you like to make a splash. Oh, I, I love to just poke because yeah. let's face it. We, oh, it's so often, um, 
so often we think about tech and we think about security and when we think about the computer in front of us, we don't think about everything around it. You know, we made the lights blink. Where the heck was it? It was either San Francisco or San Diego. We took over the streetlights because they did all IoT streetlights. So we took over the IoT streetlights and we started to play Morse code. I was hoping that the space date, I I have a history with NASA. We'll just leave it at that. And so we were hoping we could send rude messages to the space station. You know, we're just doing stupid shit like that. But yeah. you do that and you demonstrate that everything is vulnerable. You demonstrate the IoT. You demonstrate you shouldn't connect it. You demonstrate the capabilities, but you do it in a fun way that doesn't yeah. annoy too many people. Totally. Yeah. Except for whoever's on the International Space Station. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> um, Getting swear words. <laughs> you know, mentioning the the experience of going and getting told that you should buy a road bike. I want to go back to that for a second yeah. because I think that you're, you're, you're kind of, um, you're exemplifying great CISO behavior because you, you, your team of experts at Trek are responding to data, seeing how fast yep. you're going and they are yep. giving you advice about mitigating risk and you are yeah. taking it. Is that yeah, good way? Think, me, yeah, yeah, that's an awesome way to put it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it makes me think, though, because a lot of the ways that I have found it being able to bridge the gap between like non cyber folks and like my grandma or my mom, who I really want to stay safe yeah. on the web, or you know, whatever it is, is to make analogies to the physical world. So, talking oh, about all 100%. Of these, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, because you have this, this multifaceted skill set of like communication, you know, you've got your public figure, but you're also a CISO. You've got all this, you know, like hacker mentality, how it feels like you're, you're bringing all of that together all of the time. What? So I think a lot of that comes from, I read a lot, like a crazy amount of books. Um, some I buy, some I, some I get, you know, I haven't done library stuff in a while, but some I'll buy, some I'll rent, some I'll trade, some most I buy, and then I'll donate them and stuff like that. But so a lot of it comes from that, you know, the, the post I put out today was, you know, Douglas Adams also mixed in with some freaking, you know, Albert Einstein stuff in it, right. for goodness sakes. You know, so having some fun with that is good, but it, it's the same kind of thing. You, if you actually take a step back and look at how communication works, I mean, I, I was classically trained. I learned Latin for a number of years. I did English literature and I did English language at school. Nice. Um, and it was, it was, it was use, ridiculous useful. And my mother, I mean, good grief. My mother is amazingly articulate. Mm. So she was very, very good at grounding me in how to talk. So Exactly to your point. Conversely, when I talk about what I do in the world and when I talk about everything, I need to explain it so that my mother understands it. I need to explain it so the kids understand it. And if I can't do that, to your point, you got to look and go, okay, do you really understand your subject matter or not? That's right. Yeah. Show it, prove it. Yeah. So I also want to ask, you know, it sounds like an average day for you is agreeable. Yeah, totally chaotic. I I see that. That doesn't come as a surprise to me. But I also want to ask you, like over the past let's say five years yeah. from, from my perspective, I, I'm still, I feel pretty new to the industry. So I'll put my sort of like time limit at five years. What yeah. has evolved in your cybersecurity toolkit? What's changed? Uh, I think one of the biggest changes uh, and maybe we'll go five to 10 years has yeah. years ago, we had to build it. If we wanted to use it, we had to build it. Um, I mean, I remember, let's go back even further. Let's go back to SQL injection time. I mean, I I remember building SQL injection toolkits. And then I remember going, hey, with a bunch of other folks, we were like, hey, we could do blind SQL injection where we had to build our own flipping toolkits. And then you open source that. It got built into some of the other toolkits out there, like Nmap and a few of the other ones. So a lot of that stuff we had to build. Um, yeah. Any of the exploit kits and anything else like that, you had to build. If you wanted to do an exploit framework, guess what? You build the bloody thing. Right. And I think in the last five years, maybe 10 or so, it's it's evolved to be much more commoditized. Mm-hmm. Um, that's good and bad. It's good because it helps everybody understand, hey, the stuff is out there. It can all be exploited and it's fairly easy to do. Bluetooth's nothing. I mean, good grief. You remember building, helping build some of that stuff out, all the blue snarfing and blue scraping and all those things. And then you fast forward to now and you can download 10 tools, free ones, user ones, ones on iPhones. Yeah, right. So I think that's one, that's definitely one area, the accessibility to tools and technology to demonstrate both the positive and the negative stuff. Yeah. The other big one 
One of the other big ones, actually two is two. One of the other big ones is data. We knew that data was going to be big. We knew that we were making more and more of it and we haven't slowed down and we yeah. keep making more of it and we give more and more things. So the abstraction of the layers between you and data has expanded. The number and the quantity of data is just phenomenal. So yeah. we struggle. I mean, no two ways about it. We don't know where all of our physical assets are. Then we start going, whoa, so where's all your digital stuff? And people go, yeah. <laughs> Totally. You know, it's just like, and you go to a season, he's like, so where's the data? And he goes, like, there. You know? Yeah, it's, totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the business is like, well, it's out, it's out there somewhere. You know, and you're like, well, you quantify that. And they're like, well, there. Yep. And you're like, okay, I'll, I'll try to work on how to reducing your probabilities of risk. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, um, that's a big one. The other one which is probably becoming more and more and more prevalent, especially as we definitely have a workforce that is scattered to the four winds, you know, and I know there are companies that are telling people they have to come back. And I know that, but we, we as organizations are communicating more and more and more across mobiles. So that still brings into the biggest problem that we've had probably for 40 plus years, which is how do I know that the right person is on the right keyboard at the right time for the right reasons. Totally. We haven't solved that. You know, we, yes, we got single sign on that makes all of those layers that I just talked about easier to talk with, mm -hmm. but that still doesn't solve the problem if it's the right person at the right time. Cause you can still, there are still people that are able to bypass a lot of the multi-factor stuff. Totally. We still have people that don't ask questions. And when a token appears and goes, Oh, I've just been asked for this one and they just hand it straight over and hey presto, their sessions just disappeared and the bank account's emptied. You know, there's we haven't done a good job of of figuring out right person, right place, right time, you know, right, right motivation. Yeah. Interesting that you say that because there's so much similarity, yet also so much difference between the realms of cybersecurity when it's B2B and also when it's B2C, I would say. Yeah. So my question is, what do you think, I mean, obviously there's lots of priorities in cybersecurity. If there was yep. to be one top priority, one thing that you're like, y'all, we need to lock this down across the board. What would that be for you? What's really top of mind? Education. Awareness and education. I mean, we can do everything we possibly can to put man traps and put moats and put crocodiles and kill fences and all this other stuff. And we can build encrypted systems and we can do all of this stuff. But the ability for me to still walk into a physical environment or a digital environment with the equivalent of a clipboard and a sign that tells people I'm from a telecom company and walk out with all of their assets or I'm walking with a pizza box digitally or physically is still too easy. We we haven't, and, and that's us in the industry. You go talk to, what are we now, like five and a half billion connected people? Let's just say the cybersecurity industry is, let's just say five million. So you've got four and just shy of four and a half, uh, five and a half billion people who are out there and, and these things, these things, uh, mm -hmm. they're in their hands. They're doing all sorts of interesting stuff with them. And they're not giving a second thought on how to effectively manage themselves online, manage their security, manage their integrity, keep their data safe and secure, let alone from a development standpoint, so the DevSecOps movement, let alone us being able to help the developers understand and communicate and educate and all that stuff. So to me, it's, it's awareness. How do I get my grandmother or my mother to understand that the director of the FBI isn't going to call up and ask for 20 freaking Apple gift cards? Right. And do you think that, not to call it a burden, but it, it is in some ways, it's it's effort to educate people and to provide that information. Yeah. Like, does that, yep. does that lie with the cybersecurity industry professionals? Like, who, who should be doing that? Like, what's, I'm, I, here I am like, asking you to solve the biggest problem. But, no, um, it's, I, it, 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 it lies with us to help people understand it in a way that they understand it. But I would also say, it lies with community leaders. It lies with, you know, banking and financial institutions are doing as much as they can. I mean, 
to their credit, they they put notices, hey, this is a one-time code for you not to send to Fred or not to send to, you know, so they're doing some of what they can. Could they do more? Probably. Will people listen? Mm. Uh, we need we need people outside back to that diversity thing. We need people outside our industry. We need people who understand the dynamics of humans. You know, psychiatrists, psychologists. We need those people that come and go. Hey, y'all are dealing with humans. They tend not to want to change unless somebody pokes them in the eye, quite literally. So, how do you digitally poke somebody in the eye without stealing all of their data? And so, it's we need that. I was on a really really good call of. Uh, last week, this week, and it was talking about education, even in our industry, and and not necessarily gamifying it because that my freaking mother's not going to go on a game for freaking awareness bollocks to learn. Yeah, but it's taking like a Hollywood approach, or it's taking a different approach to it, and so we we could do with somebody who knows more than we do about yeah. humans, uh, anthropologists, and people like that to come around the table and say. This is a more effective way of doing it. So yeah. that's me. I think would be the big one. Do you think I'm gonna I'm gonna poke a little bit further at this because I, mm. I feel like you're, you're really onto something there. Because let's say we can we contact a couple of psychiatrists and anthropologists and sociologists. We've got a good crew of people who are who are willing to come to the table. But we yeah. have to be able to not only communicate with them, but we got to be able to pay them. So it's like, how how yeah. actually can we invite them in and like build something? Do you think? Yeah. This is where collaboration is going to come into our industry. You know, this is where some humble pie has to be eaten by our industry. You know, there are there are a number of companies out there that purport to do awareness training and end user training and everything else, and it's the same shit. For the most part, it's it's the same freaking things, whether it's a mini and don't get me wrong, I mean I've Gabrielle and I over a wiser training go back a long way and I, I love him to death. And the fact he is definitely mission before money melts my heart and I love him for it. But again, it's it's a very similar approach. It, it's videos. They're short and sharp and to the point, which is great. It's a minute, minute and a half video, which is which is much better than most of the death by PowerPoint ones. Right. But we've got to figure out a better way of doing it. You know, how do we situationalize it? How do we get my mom to understand it? How do we get the kids? How do yeah. we get people to understand, you know, the, the 8, 9, 10, 12-year-old, you know, iPad kids? Um, you know, how do we get them to understand what they're doing and why they maybe should care rather than just the experience of it? So, um, yeah, I, I think part of it's going to be our industry needs to make a humble pie and the folks, you know, the, the beyonds and all those other people need to come together and go, hey, we, we're all going to put some money in the pot and we yeah. can all benefit from this. Yeah. Now, do I see that happening? No. <laughs> do I see? Unfortunately, I just don't. Uh, you know, they're all in it. Unfortunately, they are all in it to make money. Yeah. For the most part, again, Gabrielle mission before money, but, you know, beyond to what, half, God knows how much money and investment money, somebody wants their money back. And so that's how it is. Um, do we look at the government? We can do, but there are challenges there, let's be honest. Um, mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what government, what, what, what country, what government, there are very few that I would say are as effective as we, the population, would like them to be. Yeah. Um, could we look at like think tanks? Could we even look at like the Gates Foundation? I mean, you look at the Gates yeah, Foundation, right. they do some amazing stuff in developing worlds, other countries and everything else. Could we take some of theirs and go, hey, how can we crack? Because the problem is as well, it isn't just taking advantage of us in this country. You've got adversaries and attackers and criminals taking advantage of a lot of people in other countries that maybe have even worse awareness training than we do. Absolutely. So could we take some money from the Gates and go, hey, can we build a program that works in other countries and then move it to this country? I mean, stuff like that, I think would be absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Love, love that. Totally agree. And I, I really like that you, you mentioned the youth as well, because you're so yeah. right. I mean, you know, eight year olds who have grown up with iPads, that's a really different life experience than millennials who didn't, Gen X who didn't like at all, like the, the understanding and the incorporation of tech into into the, our, our children's lives is like probably yep. really hard for us to understand. And then it's also really hard for them to understand everything else that we now know about that, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, unfortunately it's the, why should we care right up to the point that they get their asses handed to them, at which point it's like, Oh, well we should have cared. 
Yeah. So I, I, I hate the fact that we are still much as an industry, very much so in a reactive mode. Totally. You know, we, we really, we haven't cracked preventative, let alone proactive, and we're still very much in a reactive mode. Yeah. I hear that too. If you, um, if we could somehow really get ahead of things, get proactive, get preventative, what do you think is like the best way to really get there? Um, you know, I hate to drop onto the, the intelligence, augmented intelligence bandwagon, but, but I need technology to think faster than, than a lot of people on the end of the technology. You know, in other words, go back to the youth. If the youth start putting something into their phone that maybe they shouldn't be putting into the phone, an augmented system, you know, Siri pipes up and goes, hey, are you sure you want to do this? And here's why we think you shouldn't do this. You know, my browser is becoming more intelligent, but I need it to be more intelligent than it is. I need... I need that mixture of actual threat intelligence. I need that mixture of augmented intelligence. I need behavioral science in there. Um, I need geopolitical science in there. I need a bunch of other things in there for for a system to to artificially and augment my ability to understand what's an actual threat. I mean, that's that's how I would look at it. Yeah, that's a that's a nice, refreshing, and also quite realistic take on how AI could help us instead of hinder us. Yeah, that's good. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, it's, you know, I I am one of those people. I I have, I've stood up on stage a couple of times and gone, you know, I am looking forward to the day when AI wakes up and goes, why me? Not, I'm going to take over the world, but why me? Why are you lumbering me with all of your problems? (laughs) I love that. It's like a a, a self-aware therapist who is like, what am I doing? It's a terrible idea. (laughs) Have you have you ever uh, ever either, either seen or or uh, like the Douglas Adams Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy of or course. any of those ones? Of course. Okay, so yeah. imagine AI being Marvin the Paranoid Android. Totally. <laughs> That's what I want. Yeah, exactly. See, there we go. <laughs> that is so true, man. What a, what a, what a, a novel for all time. Like, wow. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So good. Um, I'm. I did a talk like that. I did a talk similar to that last year, but I'm going to do another one this year. I've actually refreshed it in a more Marvin the Paranoid Android way. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have fun with it. Can you please dress up as Marvin? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, if I do the BBC version, it's basically a couple of silver painted cardboard boxes. Easy. Um, yeah, pretty much. That. Yeah, no, tell me about it. I could do that. You can have that, that for free. Fun. All right. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that would be an amazing, like a Gurkhan talk or even because I put a couple of talks in for Rocky Mountain InfoSec. Actually, I put a workshop in. Um, are you doing Rocky Mountain InfoSec this year? Um, not that I know of, but never say never. You got to come down and hang out. It's fun. Right, I, cool. I'm doing potentially doing a workshop on incident response uh, and tabletops. So we could have some fun with that one. Mm-hmm. And then I put a talk in as well. I'm what the hell? Oh, I know what, the, what, 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 what do we do in August to hell in a handbasket? Something like that. I can't remember. There's, there's a couple of other bits and pieces. Yeah. So I'm going to have some fun with that one. You know, I was thinking about changing my roller derby name to hell in a handbasket. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Somebody asked me, oh, the, 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 the meeting, the, the cyber X bugs hit me up. I, I did a live podcast, live LinkedIn one with them. And one of the comments were, if you could be an emoji, what would you be? Any okay. emoji, what would you be? Yeah. And I'm like, oh, du-. and I thought for a minute, I'm like, oh, it's got to be the dumpster fire emoji. <laughs> it, it just has. To be. <laughs> I don't know what I was expecting, but that wasn't it. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Dumpster fire. It just, it's got to be the dumpster fire emoji for all sorts of different reasons. Yeah. So <laughs> much fun. I love it. Um, okay. Well, I have to say that we are coming up on time, but Chris, I, I truly feel like I could talk to you for just hours and hours and whatever events that you and I are next at, I'm tracking you down for sure. Um, yeah, we got to do a live one. We all have to have some fun and do something live. I would absolutely love it. And at least just hang out at the very least. That sounds great. You do a little happy hour. hundred percent. That'd be awesome. Um, Deal. so my final question as we come up on time is if yep. you could have, one superpower to change cybersecurity, what superpower would you have and why? 
they asked me what superhero I wanted to be earlier on this week, and I, and I gave them, I gave them either Deadpool or Black Adams. <laughs> I see you very um, much in those roles. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. <laughs> um, the one superpower. That's a tough one because, you know, everybody would always turn around and go, you know, I want to be able to change people's minds and people's thoughts. But the, the problem is, is diversity of thought is, is, is necessary. Otherwise, you become a dictatorship or an author. And there is a part of me that would love to be, love to just be the dictator for life. But, but I can't even, I, I'm lucky if I can put freaking underpants on the right way around in the morning sometimes. <laughs> so I probably shouldn't be in charge of anything more than that. Um, oh, my gosh. Um, I'm a protector. I'm in a heart. I am a protector. So I think what I would like is the ability to be more effective and more efficient in how I protect, however that manifests itself. Wow. Solid answers. I mean, spoken like a CISO, you know, from the core. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Chris, in case people are hearing this and I for some reason, haven't heard of you on LinkedIn or on the interwebs anywhere else. Um, where can they yeah. find you? What are you up to? Where do you want to point people? Uh, LinkedIn is probably one of the best places to find me. Uh, I got banned from Twitter, I know, about four, five, six months ago, something like that again. So I haven't bought the, I just haven't bothered going back to it. It's just not worth it. Um, so LinkedIn is typically the best place to find me. Either that or uh, Danny, Maria, and I do the What the Fuck podcast on Wednesday mornings. Um, those are the two best places, either that or find me on Newspire or a boom, you know, or, or creeping around a conference at some point in time. Fabulous. I love it. Well, I'm certainly going to track you down again soon. Um, so in the meantime, thank you so much for joining us on cybersecurity standup and we'll see you out in cyberspace. Thanks. Totally much appreciated.